let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London. I'll show you something to make you Pip, change. pip. Telly ho. Jules Guides here, in which I wander around London and tell you fascinating facts. And um, this week, well, we've been hanging around in Covent Garden, then we've done St Giles. It's so overlapping that we're still in this area. But we're going to head over sort of towards Drury Lane and down Endell Street. Anyway, you'll see. But look, don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you enjoy these videos because it really helps and it will help me finally get onto Strictly Come Dancing, which obviously is my whole <laughs> raison d'etre in life. Um, what's, what's this little bit called here? I know, it's the end of Long Acre anyway that leads to Covent Garden's up there, but I just wanted to talk about this thing over here. This is an old favourite with tour guides and cab drivers always telling me about this. Apparently, well, the story goes that um, this on this junction here, back in the like, 30s and 40s, the police used to direct traffic, you know, and, uh, and they liked to... There was an old rusty nail here that they'd sometimes hang their coat onto. Um, but then when they redid the building, the builders knocked down the whole thing and the police had nowhere to hang their coat when they were directing the traffic. So they say that as a gesture of goodwill, the builders installed this hook for them there so then they can use it to hang things up. And that's why it doesn't have the traditional Metropolitan Police kind of font, because it wasn't put there by the police. It was actually put there by the builders. That's what they say, but I, I don't know if it's true. But anyway, it's a lovely story. I like it, so it's good enough for me, all right? Have you seen the old man in a closed-down market kicking up the papers with his worn OK, let's just test, Simon. How do you pronounce that, Simon? Ye old print shop. See, that proves what I have hitherto suspected, which is that Simon does not pay attention when I'm filming Jules Guides. It's the old print shop. Or the oldie print shop. Ye old print shop. Not ye, you said ye. Yes, what is it's it? It's not ye, it's the. That's a, that's a thorn. It's a, oh. it's a, it's a, that the Y is an old English ah. character for th. Th, 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 th. Do you ever go in there, Simon, the London Graphic Centre? I've been in there a couple of times, yeah. As you walk around this area, which I guess is called Seven Dials, sort of, it's sort of between Chartres Avenue and, and Covent Garden, you keep seeing all these like ladies above. Like, you see that? She's called a demi virgin. <laughs> Since 1391, the whole area here was owned by the worshipful company of Mercers. Mercers are like cloth makers or something. And that's the emblem of the Mercers, a demi virgin. You know? I had to look up what a demi-virgin was, actually. It's a lady who flirts a lot with blokes and kisses them and lets them get very close, but will not let them do the business, you know. You know what I'm saying. In his eyes you see no pride And how loose the at his side Yesterday's papers tell him yesterday I love this sheet full of all the, um, what used to be warehouses, obviously. Look at those pulleys and stuff, that they've kept them all very authentic. I think that part there, or this part, I don't know which part, was the Woodyard Brewery. They had tunnels underneath so they could take all the beer barrels to various pubs without having to get in the way or getting mugged, because it was a pretty nasty area back in the day around here. But it's a place of particular fondness for me, because just down there where that lady's standing, is the entrance to what used to be the basement, where Jules on vocals with Little Lost Lou on the guitar used to go and rehearse in their band Spandex Nappy Rash. <laughs> I think it was that door there where you used to go. I was about sort of 18 or 17 or something. I'm the guy with the long hair, like <laughs> screaming on vocals. <laughs> I don't remember if it was that one or that one, but uh, anyway, think about a dance now. <laughs> We're just coming up to Langley Street. I'm always going on about if you subscribe, I might get enough subscribers to be on Strictly Come Dancing. Well, if you want to learn how to dance, just next to the London Film School over here is uh, Pineapple Dance Studios. Oh, oh hello. Are you Laura? No. No, I'm not Lara, I'm Foxy. Oh, oh come on. <laughs> of course you are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to Anthony's class. Perfect, you're going to be in Studio 2, just around this way, in this one here. Oh, OK. Wish me luck. Just get over it. There he is, Anthony King. What are we going to learn today? We're going to do NSYNC's Bye Bye Bye. Check it out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. OK, 
Okay, let's try. I teach the 80s, 90s class at Pineapple Dance Studios. I've been teaching here since 2004, so 17 and a half years. And I teach Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Monday, we are doing uh, Prince 1999. Thursday, Bangles, Manic Monday. So we do an 80s or 90s hit every lesson. We do a different one. I quite like this fire escape. It makes yeah. me feel like we're the kids in, in from New York, fame. New York. Yeah, we're the kids from New fame. York. Aggressive, Jules. You gotta be aggressive. Yeah, what's this pineapple? Well, this was a disused pineapple warehouse, and Debbie Moore, OBE, she created this famous dance studio, and lots of celebrities over the time have filmed music videos. Amber. This is Amber Rose. She's an it's her birthday, and she's an incredible dancer. Amber Rose. Does anyone have an amazing name yes. in here? Amber, I've just mixed Foxy. They all sound like Bond girls. Ah, Bonnie Langford. And Wayne sleeps here all the time. That Wayne, he sleeps here, does Wayne he? Sleep. Oh, sorry, I thought you said Wayne sleeps here. <laughs> but Madonna filmed Hung Up in her pink leotard in that Studio One right over there. Yeah, you can do um, classical classes, so you've got technique, you've got ballet, you've got tumbling. Capoeira. Oh, you do capoeira? We have capoeira here. Amazing talent here. Oh, I've done some capoeira. My jinga, my kera jinks, oh, they're yeah, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I teach every Saturday at 4 p.m. You play instrument, you sing, and you dance. The three things together. Paranaue, Paranaue, Parana, Paranaue, Paranaue, Parana. I'm an author of 15 books. By chance. Hey, by moment. chance. Yeah, this is available in the Pineapple Store, which is just across the road. And it's about dance history, fitness, nutrition. In the Pineapple Store, you can buy the attire. Yes, or... all your dance gear. And, and Pineapple's a fashion brand as well as a dance brand. We put up all the dance videos and it shows a lot of the fun and you can check out what's going on and it'll be great to see you online. Right, let's see what I got. Sorry I have to talk over this bit, otherwise we get a copyright strike for using the music. Brilliant, that was a brilliant You class. were good actually. How was that for you? Great. And to be like the, he's the best teacher in Pineapple. So how can you tell me you're lonely and say for you that your sun don't shine? This is Neil Street. About ten years ago, Neil Street was my favourite street in Covent Garden. It was really bustling and and now it's like I don't know, it's nothing down here for me. I mean, look, over here there used to be Food for Thought. Do you remember Food for Thought, the vegetarian yes, I place? Do. I used to come here all the time. It's so sad that if everything, yeah. I've never seen, I've never seen one of these before here in London. But, but that's the kind of shop that's, uh, that are opening up shop. now. It's not a shop. Park your bike for free. It's a garage for there, bikes. There's no way that that would have been there 10 years ago. No. Doesn't feel the same, Simon. Anyway, Neil Street is named after, and Neil's Yard is named after uh, Thomas Neil, who was master of the mint and groom porter to, I think it was William of Orange. I don't know which king it was. Anyway, basically, he was in charge of gambling and stuff at court. And uh, he provided cards and dice and uh, settled any disputes that took place whilst gambling. I think Charles II said that he didn't want anybody building on this area. He thought it would ruin his air, make it too cramped for his uh, palaces which were nearby. But eventually after he died, I think they said, OK, look, Thomas Neal, you can build some stuff around here. So that's why all these places are named after him. So Neal's Yard here, for example. This bit is still quite bustling around here. This is at Neil's Yard, it's really nice. In 1840, there used to be a cow shed here, but they had a fire. I don't know which one was the cow shed, but they had a fire. But it was started on purpose, because back in those days, you got a reward, like a shilling or something, if you reported a fire that had broken out, so they could come and put the fire out. So it's a bit of a stupid system, really. Like, but yeah, it's still rather nice, lots of cafes, etc. But this one up here is bought by Michael Palin and Terry Gilliam. In the 70s, they, they bought this. That's why it says Monty Python. That nice sort of warehousey feel to the place. If you want cheese, you'll like these. <laughs> Let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London. I'll show you something to make you change your mind. 
Simon, do you know much about Freemasonry? I've never known what Freemasons do. But anyway, all the things around here, there's got a Freemasons pub over there. And is it all just disembodied eyes above pyramids on the back of American banknotes? Hello, chaps. Hello. Uh, do you actually... No, come on. Do you actually do that? No, we don't actually do that. <laughs> this place here, people are always saying to me, oh, you've got to go into the Freemasons' halls. So let's do it. Ooh, hello, Tim. Hello, hello. Morning, morning. Hello, do I give you a funny handshake? No, let's just give you a fist bump. just give you a fist bump. secure fist bump. <laughs> this is Freemasons' Hall, Covent Garden. And this is where basically we have all our central offices, our charities, our, we've got a cafe, we've got a library, we've got a museum, we've got an archive, and you're stood now in the shop which opened only a couple of months ago. You can buy basically everything from traditional attire for Freemasons through to the jewels and, and collars and things like that, books and postcards and... Uh, and anyone can come in here? Can anyone can come in, it's open to everyone. It's an amazing building. I it's amazing, really, isn't it? The I've whole building is a, an Art Deco masterpiece. This is the uh, lodge room of the Grand Master of the Duke of Kent. This is his private lodge room. What actually goes on in these rooms? I mean... Uh, so there are three degrees in Freemasonry. Um, and each degree is a, is a sort of a ceremony laid out for the candidate. So the first one is your initiation to Freemasonry. You are taught the importance of your role within your world and your creator. In the second degree, you're led to contemplate your role within sort of society. And these are the tracing boards that you would use in the course of the ceremony. There's three of these, again, for the three different ceremonies that all have ritual meanings and uh, an explanation that's given to the candidates as part of their initiations. And in the third degree, you're led to contemplate the inevitable destiny of all of us in death. <laughs> wow. And this is the Grand Temple. A woman in here, women. Hi, I'm Catherine Nisbet. I'm the events manager here at Freemasons Hall and I'm also a Freemason. So if you think about it in the same way as you have private members clubs that are for networking in some places or rotary clubs that help do charity, it's just another outlet like that. The difference being that it has very unique and wonderful traditional ritual. Some, but what's the some... point in learning this ritual? Why do people do it? Think of it like a play. So each person that's in the lodge, whether they're the person who's being initiated into the lodge, whether they're the worshipful master, whether they're one of the wardens, yeah. is a part in the play. Right. And they have to learn it to, in order for the, for the play to go smoothly because the other people in the lodge are watching and enjoying the play and the people who are participating are enjoying it. This is the Grand Master's throne built in 1791, used by the Prince of Wales when he was Grand Master in the uh, 1790s. King George the Fourth. George the Fourth. Oh, from says a voice off Prince screen. Regent. Prince Regent. There you from go. Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, there he is behind you. In fact, look, there he is. And over here we've got um, the Constitutions of Freemasonry, published by James Anderson in 1723. It was taken around the world as Freemasonry spread and developed around the globe, particularly to France and to America, where Benjamin Franklin paid for its publication in the early days of the American Republic there. So you can basically draw parallel lines between this constitution and that of America uh, and a number of other countries around the world. I must just be a bit thick. I can never understand what it is that... What's the point in it all? I mean, what, so is, is, is it's different it's for everybody. For it's charity, it's friendship, it's uh, finding people with common interests. You can't deny that Masons seem to have this kind of secretive reputation. And actually, it's one of the big disappointments, I think, for most people is that we are actually not secretive. So people go, oh, oh, can't go into Freemasons Hall. It's completely yeah, I must secretive. Admit, I was and I'm like, I, I was no, bit... you can come in. Like, I hold public concerts. It's not secretive. I think the only thing that's secretive we kind of hold close is the ritual. And the only reason why we do that is because we don't want to ruin it for people who've not yet done it. Right. So this is how you join Freemasonry. Basically rough, unready, but suitable for working with and working on. And that's what we end up with. It's been polished, it's been straightened, it's been squared. This was all born out of stonemasons. So if you're a medieval stonemason, you travel between the great projects around Europe in around the 13th century. But because to demonstrate your level of skill and ability, you could only really carve something which might take weeks or months, you took with you handshakes that would enable you to demonstrate your proof and proficiency to those that you sought to employ you. Tokens or passwords that would demonstrate to them that your level of ability. This one was the apron of Edward when he was Prince of Wales, went on to be Edward VIII, and this Master Mason's apron was Winston Churchill's. And this one here is Edward VIII's chauffeurs. I didn't know that, he told me. <laughs> it shows a great level, you see, so you've got both the chauffeur and the king. Uh, in the same cabinet. Oh yes, the prince and the pauper and the pauper. There you go. Yes. As you're going through it, you don't want to ruin it for somebody else. And that idea of integrity 
is you're asked not to divulge something because you'll be ruining it for the people who might be coming through the ranks. But I won't suffer a murderous end if, uh, if I do divulge. Well, I don't know. It depends on where you walk in dark place dallies in London at night. <laughs> you might well do, but it's nothing to do with us. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Cheers. Have you seen the old girl who walks the streets of London? Right, we're just coming up to Seven Dials, where all these roads converge. Originally, there were six roads here. The, the original idea was to have this big kind of sundial here, and there were six roads originally. Um, that's why, in case you're wondering why there's only six dials on the top of it, I suppose the, the plan was to call it Six Dials, but then they installed another street, so now it's called Seven Dials. But the Morning Chronicle called it a rendezvous for blackguards and chimney sweepers, so the column was removed in 1773, and it wasn't re reinstalled until 1989, according to that. So, look, you can see all the streets coming off it. This is why it's so difficult to make this film, because we didn't know which street to go down. But that one used to be called Little... Is it Little White Lion Street? You see the uh, just above oh, there, yeah, the yeah, where it says yeah. Mercer Street. They've yes, just yes, yes. plastered in a borough of Holborn. Now it's borough of Camden, I suppose. And on these bollards, you see all these bollards. They've all got um, a little emblem on them of a beautiful little deer with an arrow through him. And that is a reference to St Giles himself, who was known to be very kind to animals. So you see a lot of this all over the place. Because this whole area is still St Giles, but we didn't cover this part in my video a few weeks ago because there was too much to do. But it's this really poor area back a few hundred years ago. I rather like this road a bit more than Neil Street these days. I prefer Monmouth Street. Monmouth, named after the bastard son of King Charles II, the Duke of Monmouth, who lived over in Soho Square. Just there, that's where his house was. He's the one who tried that Monmouth rebellion, didn't he? My history is a bit sketchy, but uh, the Monmouth Coffee Company is very highly regarded. I just find there's not quite enough room for your legs in there, <laughs> if you're six foot six like I am. They even have you in the window, mate. <laughs> I want image rights. There was a lot of French Huguenots were living around this area, which probably explains why they've got the French hospital there. It's actually now the Covent Garden Hotel. It's odd because that's got the English flag. The French flag is the one that's on the place opposite. But it was somewhere around here that Hogarth did his famous picture of Gin Lane. Because one in every five or four shops or buildings served alcohol. There was a real gin epidemic in the 18th century. Reports in the 1840s spoke of pavements swarming with pigs, poultry, ragged children and windows patched with paper and rags. And Lord Byron, when he was up in Parliament, he said, I have been in some of the most oppressed provinces of Turkey, but never under the most despotic infidel governments did I behold such squalid wretchedness as I have since my returning to the very heart of a Christian country. She's got no time for talking. She just keeps her right on walking, carrying the whole... In 1861, there was a census and there were 25 Italian organ grinders lived in this house. <laughs> so popular with Italian organ grinders, apparently. And then the one next door here, I think that was that whole section, was taken up with a, a lodging house, a Tom Farmer's lodging house. It was called The Kip. And that was a place where you could sleep on a rope. I mean, back in those days, it's so bad. I mean, up until the end of the 19th century, if you were poor and you needed a place to sleep for the night, I think for a bed or something, or for a seat or something, it was like two or three shillings or something, but maybe for like one shilling, you could sleep on a rope, which meant sitting down next to other people and they'd, they'd have a rope that went across you like that. And then you just fell asleep, you just like hung over this rope so you didn't fall onto the floor. And in the morning, they just came along, cut the rope and everyone fell down. They just turfed them out into the street. Horrendous. Hard times though, Simon. Hard times. So how can you tell me you lonely? So in case you're wondering why there's all these bananas on the side of the buildings over there, I think that's a reference to when that was a banana ripening warehouse. Bananas sold presumably at the um, Common Garden Fruit Market. But then in 1961, it was bought by Donald Albert and Margot Fontaine, the famous ballerina, and they turned it into the Don Mar Warehouse, which is the famous theatre. That's what Don Mar is, Donald Albert and Margot Fontaine. I thought it was interesting anyway. Let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London. At the end of Endell Street here, 
Have you ever been to the Oasis Sports Centre? They've got an outdoor swimming pool there. Although I've got to say the changing rooms for me were not, I don't know, I like a bit more privacy, let's put it that way, in the, in the changing rooms. But yeah, they've got an outdoor swimming pool there, which is quite, quite cool. And it was there that I did my audition for Big Brother. And I got down to the last 50, and then they didn't choose me. I think they were after people who would go to pieces a bit more. But right opposite there is this uh, lovely building that used to be the St. Giles National School. It's designed by the same guy who did uh, the Royal Opera House, I believe, uh, Edward Middleton Barry. Anyway, th these days it's uh, St. Mungo's sort of shelter housing for homeless people, I think. I mean, look at that, right there in the middle of Dudley Court, which isn't exactly the most picturesque place. This actually used to be a military hospital. Um, up here on the left, you'll see a nice plaque. Dr. Flora Murray and Louise Garrett Anderson, they were physicians and set up the Women's Hospital Corps when the First World War broke out. They were kind of snubbed by the Brits during the First World War. They went over to France and were welcomed by uh, the people in Paris to come and help with, uh, you know, the wounded soldiers and everything. Anyway, after a while, the British War Office were amazed at how well these women were running their hospital in France and they got them to come back to London. They established the first military hospital entirely to be staffed by women. And uh, actually, I think when the OBE was first introduced around, was it 1917? They were two recipients of the first of the OBEs. Order of the British Empire. I like it when they put plaques there like that because it means I don't have to remember things. <laughs> so I love it Endell Street, this side. I mean, little places you might miss, all these little cafes, restaurants and stuff, but a particular favorite of mine is Blackout 2 Vintage Clothing, where I bought my straw boater and I believe other friends of the show go. Hello. 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 The shop's been here for about 30 years. It's vintage, so it goes from 1920s to 1970s. Bracelets and hair flowers. We've got some fabulous men's hats, oh. trilbies, bowlers, Excellent. boaters. Excellent. So actually, 20s. I bought one of those from here. I don't yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're the real deal, those. My boss and her husband just source everything individually, and obviously the condition of it is really important. We get all sorts. We do a lot of film, theatre, telly, um, and then obviously we've just got our gorgeous regular customers that just enjoy good quality clothing. Tom Carradine, for example. Tom Carradine, for example, <laughs> as well. Um, Friend of the show. Thanks. See you later. See you later. In the all-night cafe at a quarter past 11, Man sitting there. So Dundley Court here, where the military hospital used to be, uh, was originally a, a Victorian workhouse for the poor, which closed down in uh, 1914. And there's actually a famous photograph taken here of a lady holding another person's baby because the parent was too despondent or weak to look after it herself. They were known as uh, St Giles Crawlers. Charles Booth, who compiled his poverty map of London, he described the area just around the corner there as being worst street in St Giles, full of Cockney Irish who, while not immoral, would steal if they got the chance and bash it in the heads of policemen. Go over here, Simon. Just mentioned the Rock and Soul place. I mean, they claim to be the oldest fish and chip shop in London. They say that they've been here since 1871. I don't know. I cannot verify that. I thought it started up in our Stepney Green video. We said that it started in the East End, didn't we? So I don't know. But nevertheless, they were very friendly in there and they let me film. It's a lovely place to come and have fish and chips. I think we might come here later, perhaps. It's a nice spot. Looking at the world over the rim of his teacup, but he's still last an hour. How long ago since you've seen one of these? Dog nuisance, 20 pounds to, to foul in the foot. Yeah, I haven't seen one of those for absolutely ages. I think that's from the 70s. Yeah, that is uh, that's pretty old, isn't it? Look at this, Betterton House. To the right there, you see the P there on the wall. That indicates that in the Second World War, there was uh, sort of air raid shelters down oh, here. See. Yeah, people could, people could go down there into the shelter. Ooh. That's what that means. I like things yeah, like that. That's great. So how can you tell me you lonely and say for you that okay. you're so Going down towards the northern end of Drury Lane, that rather ordinary office block over there is where the first ever Sainsbury's shop opened up. It was a dairy. It was a, I think they were selling dairy products or something in 1869. And now they're all over the place. 
But further along here, now you see this very picturesque travel lodge up here. This is where the plague started in London. I know I mentioned it in my Covent Garden video, but the plague didn't start in the travel lodge. But uh, back in 1665, it was here that the Flemish weavers opened up a package from Holland and uh, it was infected with the plague. And uh, a thousand people a day were dying of the plague around here. And the neighbouring parishes even had to mount guards to stop people leaving the parish of St Giles, which was particularly bad. But William Boghurst, the excellently named apothecary, hung around and decided to treat people. He was treating 40 people a day and he didn't even die of the plague. So good old William Boghurst, eh? But uh, anyway, whatever was there before, he knocked it down and built that. <laughs> Rather nice down this end of Drury Lane, the north end. You've got some lovely cafes. That's rather nice, that one there. Reminds me a little bit of some of the cafes that I saw in Serbia. But terrific cafes in Serbia, by the way. I say, in this pub here, and many pubs make this claim, but they claim to have the oldest licence in London. There's certainly been a pub there since 1536, they say. So this is supposed to be where Dick Turpin planned some of his highway robberies in there. But it's been rebuilt since then. They used to have a Space Invaders machine in there as well. I don't know if they still got it. Let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London. I'll show you something. Do you remember when we were in this pub and that guy bought me a pint? He paid for it. We were sitting That's in there. That's right, yes. <laughs> and the guy was sitting in the bar. He didn't say anything to us the whole time. He, he came over and he just said, oh, I paid for those beers for you. Do you know why he did it? Why? It was out of respect. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. Yep, cheers, man. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you like the videos. And um, if you want, you can also follow me on my Instagram, which is at Jules Guides Official. And above all, don't forget to come and have a pint at this excellent pub, The Cross Keys, which I highly recommend. See you next time.